Unidentified flying object. Researcher on a mission with Dr. J. Annie Elias. Welcome back to another episode of Dr. J Radio Live. Of course, I am your host, Dr. J. And always, we have a great show for you today. But today is a super, superstar guest that honestly, I have been working on for months. And I'm very excited that he's going to be here. But first, let's talk about contact in the desert. I loved to see all of the people that were there. It was nice to see you all. I would like to see more of you listeners show up next year. Of course, a lot of ticket winners, and sadly, not all of them were claimed. So hopefully next year, you guys that win will show up. What I'd like to hear before the next show is what were your favorite parts, what were your worst parts, and everything in between. What were the stories that stuck out from your mind from being at Contact in the Desert? All you have to do is go to drjradiolive.com and send it through the contact. Now, let's talk about our guest. You're going to hear me say this when I introduce him. So I'm just going to go ahead and spill the beans. Well, first, I honestly compare this guy to a true visionary, a visionary along the lines of Nikola Tesla, Buckminster Fuller, uh, and even Leonardo da Vinci, because all three of these people, and then some, Arthur C. Clarke is another one, really went beyond their the beyond what is the norm and thought outside the box and really created things that were very not recognized for their time, but were so extraordinary that only after their life were they finally being recognized. Well, this guest was struggling and people weren't taking him seriously because of the fact that he lacked a degree. Well, in comes Foster Gamble, the maker of the movie Thrive, and sees the theories that this gentleman created. And it blew him away because this gentleman that I'm about to introduce is really on the track. This is the unified field theory to its max and then some. You're going to hear so much about physics, and how the ancient world had a link to it, and much, much more. I, I'm giving you too much information on who's coming on, so let's just go ahead and bring on our guest, and that happens to be Nassim Harriman. Mr. Harriman, welcome to the show. Hi, Dr. J. It's great to be on your show, and you can call me Nassim. <laughs> Nassim, thank you so much. Honestly, it is a true honor to have you on. Ever since I watched the movie Thrive, uh, which essentially, to me, put you on the map because that's the first time I recognized the theories that you uh, expanded on, theories that you created. And then, of course, after the interview with Foster Gamble, I knew you were the person that I had to speak. In my eyes... And I said this to uh, Mr. Gamble when we were on the show. Uh, you are a true visionary. Uh, somewhere along the lines of uh, Albert Einstein, Nikola Tesla, Buckminster Fuller, and Leonardo da Vinci, among others. And and I guess the first place to start with you is I want to ask you, because when we were talking with Foster, he said that a lot of academics uh, didn't pay attention to you because of a lack of a degree, even though you were on point with your theory. So I wanted to ask you, how did you come about to finding the answers, which we're going to speak to uh, about the the answers to the universe, essentially, without uh, giving a clue to what they are. Um, well, thank you. Actually, you know, it's a really big honor of being associated with all these people. I'm trying not to disappoint you. Um, but uh, for sure, um, when I was a young boy, I was extremely interested in nature. And... You know, I didn't fit well in the academic structure. I was extremely dyslexic. Um, I had, you know, brown skin and a strange name. And so I was bullied a lot. And I, I just felt very isolated and very separated 
um, from the world except when I went in nature. When I was in nature, I felt connected and I felt like there was this, um, you know, communion with nature that I could feel the, the force of nature in my bones or something. And I, and I just, when I looked at nature, I could see um, patterns. Um, emerging, like the, the way branches of a tree um, separate and the, the way uh, the roots of the tree grow and, and the way petals of a flower emerge and, and, and the way leaves grow on the stem of the flower and all this stuff. And I thought there must be some fundamental, um, some fundamental geometric uh, structure at the base of creation from which all of nature, you know, is inspired to grow that way. And, um, and so for me, it was kind of the start of an exploration into the foundation of reality. At the very, very base of reality, I felt there was something to discover there. And I spent the rest of my life looking for it. And you are truly making waves, just like Nikola Tesla at, at his era. Uh, he was way ahead of his time, underappreciated. And as you know, it was only after his death that we started using the AC current, which was rejected by uh, Edison in favor of the DC current then. And so many other things, such as uh, the Tesla coils that we now use. Do you believe that you were giving the answers to the universe by some force such as the same way uh, Leonardo da Vinci was getting uh, ahead of his time in the same way that Nikola Tesla was receiving information from uh, dreams and, and the higher realm? Um, yeah, actually, uh, I believe that the brain and the spinal cord and actually the nervous system and the whole body, even the, even the bone structure of the body, which are piezoelectric and so on, are actually acting like an antenna in the structure of space-time. That is, that we don't actually manufacture our thoughts. I mean, we we have a creative uh, license on the, on our thoughts, but but that we're actually downloading information from the structure of space and time at the quantum level. That that's a field of information that we're bathing in. And, and that field is actually what's creating all of our reality. And we are part of that field, and we're like a bio-crystal antenna, like a radio set uh, that's tuned to certain frequencies. And, and if you can tune the radio set just right to certain um, level of information, all of a sudden you, you can get very, very profound information. And many of the greatest thinkers and innovators in our world describe this, um, you know, these moments of illumination as, as being receiving information from, from another source, from, from something bigger than them. Exactly. And so many people, including Foster Gamble, had the same thing where he was meditating uh, to the universe and, and asking for the answer. And and just like you said, the, the greatest thinkers of not just our time throughout history have had this. And as you know, it, it's we use such a small portion of our brain. And of course, a lot of people talk about the pineal gland being the spiritual antenna. If we were to use our full potential of our brain, do you think we could unlock abilities such as telekinesis, telepathy, and other things like that? Uh, absolutely. I think that um, actually these other portions of our brain that appear to be on un unused uh, are actually parts that are having a very strong interaction with that field I was talking about. And if we were to start to be able to control that, we could influence the field at a much deeper level, at a much stronger level, and, and have all sorts of uh, capacities that to, to us today would appear like magical or, you know, spiritual, but actually that I think are some fundamental mechanics of how the universe works. And, it, and, you know, a lot of the things that we think of as mystical and so on, I believe, are just the physics we haven't understood yet. 
and and I think we're getting closer and closer to understanding them, and that's going to change our world our world at a really profound level. I wholeheartedly agree, and sadly, I think that the uh, the world powers that be have had an effort, a campaign to essentially dumb us down and prevent us from uh, reaching this consciousness. Do, do you agree with that? Yeah, I, well, I think that um, it's been kind of a side effect of the evolution of our society. I, I, you know, I tend not to associate, uh, certainly there's, there's some fractions in the world that may not have the best intent, and, and I you know, I wouldn't deny that for a minute, but but I think that generally, um, you know, it is part of the evolution of a society. Um, you know, when when the mechanical revolution and industrial revolution occur, um, there's a certain mentality that came with it, and you know, the idea was to create people that you know could work in factories, and and the educational system was set up so that. Everybody thought the same, and and you know everybody fitted nicely in in the, in the box that society needed people to fit in. Um, I, you know, I think that the evolution is now taking us to a higher higher level of awareness, and where people individuality and people capacity to tune into certain sets of information are starting to be more honored, but we're still far from uh, actually being able to act, to listen to those people. Uh, I, I experience that myself almost daily. Uh, much of my work is censored. Uh, the scientific community has censored many of my papers. Um, so it, it, it's very difficult to break through. Uh, and, and But it is happening, and so I'm very encouraged. I, I see it happening every day as well. So, so I think that in... In some ways, we're we're finally getting there. Um, hopefully, we're getting there on time because we're running against a clock right now. Uh, we need some of these solutions that comes with these new understandings very, very quickly because our society is reaching a very important nexus in its evolution. That's right. You know, with, with this massive weather. Uh, anomalies that are happening happening the more earthquakes everything we are essentially destroying our planet and you're right we are running against the clock and i i've seen that your work has been censored and i'm finally glad that people are finally really accepting it because you truly do have the answers and speaking of the answers i think this is a good time to finally bring in what you thought. Now, I'm going to take us back to 1923. Albert Einstein won the Nobel Physics Prize, and I'm actually going to turn it over to you on what he won and what the theory was that he talked about, and then how you expanded on that and really came up with the answers to everything. I want I, Truly, everything from a, an atom all the way up to the super cluster of galaxies and everything in between. Yeah, well, you know, um, Einstein won the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect, and um, in in this paper, basically, he um, described and, and used some of the work that was done by Planck, uh, Max Planck, which was the father of, of quantum physics, um, and, ba- and, and described this um, this little photon, this little packet of energy that Planck had um, had hypo- hypothetically uh, utilized to solve problems that has to do with the thermal emission of a black body, but without getting into much details, uh, Einstein uh, described this little packet of, of energy, this discovery that actually energy is not a continuum smooth uh, thing, but that it actually is um, is made up of little packets so that it's quantized. And, and, uh, and Einstein eventually called that a photon and described these photons interacting with um, some of these conductors to produce the photoelectric effect. And this um, was very significant because it's, kind of whipped 
the work of Max Planck birth uh, the foundation of quantum theory. Um, what I did is I realized that using these little packets of energy at the very fundamental, so you can imagine there's different frequency or different wavelengths of these packets, and there is very, very teeny ones that are called Planck uh, length uh, quantas or Planck length um, entities. And these little packets um, make up the structure of space-time at the quantum level. They're very space uh, at the quantum level, or the vacuum of the quantum uh, structure is very, very dynamic. It has all this energy in it. And what I did is I used these little packets to try to to demonstrate or to to examine if I could use them to describe the gravitational field of black holes at the, at the cosmological level. And I found a solution in which uh, a volume to surface ratio of these little packets into a black hole, you can think of these little packets as little pieces of information. You can imagine like a, if you take all the information of these packets that are in a black hole, um, that are inside the volume, and then there is some on the surface of that black hole, that there would be a surface-to-volume ratio. And I found that that surface-to-volume ratio is exactly equivalent to the gravitational force of that black hole, or its gravitational mass, or if you'd like, its mass. So, so I found a solution to gravity, a solution to Einstein's gravitational equation, using the little quantum packets, which usually don't mix. Usually you got quantum physics on one side and you got relativity on the other that takes care of gravity. And the, don't, the two don't talk. One is for big objects and one is for small objects. And, but we know that big objects are made out of small objects. And so I, w I found this, this first solution of, for gravity with small objects, uh, with prompt uh, structures, and then I applied it to the nuclear of an atom and found the correct solution for that, for the radius of a proton, which is really, really important uh, because it is the heart of the atom. It, it is the sen It is the force that's in the middle of an atom that that makes up all of our atomic structure, all of the stuff we call reality around us, and. And what this demon demonstrated is that reality is actually made out of this energy that's in the space. So it's actually the space that makes up the matter, not the matter that defines the space. Exactly. And one thing that you mentioned is, in, which is so true, and a lot of people seem to forget, every large thing is made up of small things. And even the small things are made up of the absolute smallest things, which, of course, are atoms. And you can go even uh, further than that and mm -hmm. go with, within the atoms, like the, the nucleus mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Uh, now, let's talk about the, the Taurus and, and, of course, how this applies to what you just said. Well. You know, that's the thing, it's that um, these dynamics, first of all, I, I think that there's something remarkable uh, when I did these equations. Um, first, the, the, the radius of the proton I predicted uh, in the 2012 paper uh, was uh, the, the, the radius of the proton or the nuclei of the atom was measured more precisely than ever in history in 2000. Uh, 13, and a few months after I had made the prediction, and my prediction happened to be exactly right, or within 0 .00036 of the measurement, or inside the margin of error, error of their measurement, which means that my prediction might be exact and the measurement is getting closer to it. Um, this is, to this day, the most precise uh, theoretical prediction of the nuclear of an atom uh, on the planet, the standard model is the standard model of particle physics is off by four percent. That creates a lot of problem for the standard model. Um, but um, but as well, when I did the calculation, there was something that was really remarkable, and that is as when I counted the amount of information or the amount of plants that are present 
inside the nuclei of the proton or uh, inside the proton in, in the nuclei of the atom, um, you know, the the, nu- the the proton, in, I mean, for people to understand scale, let, let's just give it an idea of scale. You're made out of about a hundred trillion uh, cells. So that's already, cells are already really small. I mean, there's a hundred trillion of them in you, 50 to a hundred trillion of them in you. And each one is made of about a hundred trillion atoms. So already, and so now you get a sense how small atoms are. Um, and then if you, if an atom was like the dome of the Vatican, then the nuclei or the proton in the middle would be the head of a pin. So that's really teeny. So like the volume, so the volume of a proton is like 10 to the minus 39 uh, centimeter cube. It's teeny little volume, right? A, a period with 39 zeros behind it. Um, and so, so it's very small. Um, but when I counted the plants, because the plants are so teeny, if I, if I grew a plant, a plant so it was the size of a grain of sand, then the proton would be a, a diameter from here to Alpha Centauri, which is about 40 trillion uh, kilometers. So this, this, this little plant, when I counted how many there is in a proton, I found that there was the exact amount of mass energy, if I calculated their mass energy or their inflammation, as all the other protons in the universe. That is, the mass of the little plant, the energy level of the of the vacuum structure inside a proton is equivalent to all the other protons in the universe, uh, the mass of the universe, meaning all the information of all the other protons in the universe is present in each proton in terms of quantum information. And people might think, well, how is that possible? Like, you know, how do you get a whole universe inside a proton? It's not the whole universe. It's just the information of the universe, just like, you know, you might have a CD with an orchestra music on it, and the information that all the orchestra produce, you don't have the violin on there and, and the cello and all this stuff. You just have the information. And so it really showed that the universe is connected, that, that the universe is holographic in nature, and there's more and more science emerging, even in the mainstream, with the holographic principle that's showing that the universe is truly holographic in nature, and many articles are being published on that um, lately. Um, but but uh, how it relates to the Taurus is that it, um, so it showed that as well that the information that's present in each point is interacting with all the other points, and, and it's, it's in a constant flow. And the dynamic of that flow is a flow that goes from the inside to the outside and then interact with the field and then back to the inside in a continuous feedback um, loop or feed forward loop, if you'd like. And, and, and this, the geometry that accommodates that kind of dynamic is a torus and you see it everywhere. You see it in the magnetic fields of the earth. You see it in the magnetic fields of the sun and, um, galaxies, uh, uh, quasar, pulsars. I mean, you see it everywhere. The, the, the toroidal dynamics of nature is very prominent. And it's very, um, uh, it's very telling about this, this constant feedback. So, so what I'm describing here, just for the listener, is that, is that the universe is talking to itself in a continuous feedback in which each point is in contact with every other point. And that's how it's self-organized, which, which is a big problem in science. Is how, how is the universe all of a sudden making incredible complexities like the biology on our planet and, and human beings with 100 trillion cells and all this stuff? How is it doing that? Because if you do it under random functions, you don't, you don't expect that. If you think the universe is just random, disconnected, nothing is talking to anything, things are isolated, it would not produce this type of complexity. The, the probability of this, of one cell to occur is, is, is extremely low or, or not even 
relevant. So, um, so this starts to tell us why the universe is able to self-organize. The torus, the way it, it works, as you mentioned, is energy flows in and then it comes out and, and goes circles around mm-hmm. the field and then flows back in. Is that, that's correct, right? Yeah, that's correct. And, and when it does that, it comes back changed because through its journey, it's, um, you know, it's, 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 um, it's been altered by, this, by the rest of the environment. So, so it's always coming back changed. It, it's going through a, a learning process as it's, as it's moving across. It's not staying the same. It's, it's like a dynamic equilibrium. So it's essentially it's evolving each time it goes through the center and, and back around. Exactly. And, uh, and, as it, and, and what I'm showing in my equation is that when it goes through the center, it's learning from all the other torsos in the universe. It's, it's interacting with the whole and then comes back and, and, and as an individual and then interacts with the whole again and comes back. As an, and this is how the universe evolves. Now, you've been able to apply this to everything. And, and I know we, we hinted at that, uh, things as small as, as a proton to an, an, an atom, to a cell, to a human body, yeah. to anything in nature to the galaxy. Can you give some examples, uh, for instance, our atmosphere on our planet to our sun and, and how they are using the to- toroidal dynamics? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, if you look at the Coriolis effects and the atmosphere on our, on our planet, you find that um, the hurricane and typhoons are spinning in the opposite direction and the and and they move from the equator down. Uh, they move from the from the poles down to the equator, and then back up to the poles in a in a dynamic toroid. And and my theory predicted that actually the structure that makes up um, the material world is not just a single toroid, but a dual toroid, a dual torus, uh, because there is Coriolis effect, and because there's spin counter spin because there's polarity uh, and so there's always two toroids interacting making the sphere and um, and so there is one on the north pole for instance of our earth that like goes and 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 so the 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 plasma dynamics of the of the weather systems go all the way down to the equator and then back up to the pole and then from the south pole up to the equator and back down to the south pole and so we see those dynamics very clearly on our planet. Um, we see them very clearly in the solar dynamics, where we see the, the plasma dynamics of our sun, you know, where the plasma is moving up towards the pole and then back down towards the equator and the double torus structure. And this double torus creates a pinch at the equator where, where the structure of space-time is oscillating, and this is why planetary system or rings around planets and so on always orbit at the equator of things. And even you know you can look at galaxies where most of the matter is is pinched between the two torsos, um, you know, at the galactic disk or the accretion disk of the black hole, or 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 even the rings of Saturn and the uh, the rings of Jupiter. All these are unexplained phenomena in standard models. There's nothing in the stand. Einstein worked on it. Hubble worked on it. You know, but there's nothing, uh, you know, that was actually um, um, uh, complete uh, by any of them to explain why you know rings don't don't form, for instance, in a polar direction of of a planet. Or, or why planets um, orbit at the equator of a sun, or or why matter is, you know, confined or mostly confined to the to the um, to the galactic disk uh, of a galaxy. Um, this starts to explain why, and so we see those double torus dynamic as well in in pulsars, quasars, 
uh, we see these big jets coming out of black holes and those um, dynamics. And so there's, there's something very profound there um, that has to do with how this Planck field of information is moving at the quantum level. And I've been able to now prove that these big objects are actually, like black holes, are actually the result of this Planck information orbiting like this in space, making a black hole. Now, let's, how do we apply this to essentially getting to, okay, the, obviously, as you know, we've been for space travel. We've been using uh, ancient technology, really the internal combustion engine. Uh, 150 years ago, uh, you know, the same technology we were using then, burning chemicals to travel. And actually, it goes even further back than that to China thousands of years ago, or at least a thousand years ago when they were launching uh, fireworks and rockets by burning chemicals. What can we do using the, the toroidal dynamics and, and the torus and everything else and, and what you've uncovered with gravity to essentially better make better our space travel. Yeah, we, we need to transcend our space travel. I, I was just talking to an astronaut a few days ago, and, you know, we're wanting to, you know, there's large efforts in the private rocket industry to, to, uh, to have a program in which we're going to go and colonize Mars and so on. And, you know, doing all this with rocketry is actually not really feasible. And it needs to go to the next level. We need to actually understand what gravity is and learn to utilize it to our advantage and and in some ways, you know, direct it the way we want it to be directed. Just like, you know, a few hundred years ago, we learned to use the electromagnetic field to uh, better our society. So, so we learn how to use electricity and magnetism, and pretty well everything we have today in our technology is the result of understanding the electromagnetic field and how it works and, and controlling it and being able to utilize it to, uh, to better our society. The same way, is some of the equations I've written, and, and certainly the equation in which I was able to predict the radius of the proton and the force that holds the protons together, which I demonstrated in a paper, is actually gravity. It's quantum gravity that's produced by this, um, by this Planck field at the base of reality. And, and, and these equations are basically gravitational equations, but they're telling us something vastly different than the gravitational equations we've been using from Einstein. They're telling us that gravity is actually, you know, Einstein was right when he said that gravity was the curvature of space-time. That is that if you put, like, like, like if you put a ball on a trampoline surface, it curves the trampoline, and another ball would appear to be attracted. That's basically what Einstein described in his equation. Well, let's change the analogy. Let's, let's think of a, a, a tub, and you pull the plug in the tub, and you, maybe you have a rubber ducky in there. And, and you're a rubber ducky as you're taking your bath. After you pull the plug, you can see the rubber ducky. If he's far away from the plug, it's not, he's not feeling any effects. But, but if you bring it closer to where the drain is, you start to see its orbit, and you start to see it getting attracted towards the drain. Um, if, if you were to use that analogy to describe Einstein's field equation, um, the curvature of the surface of the water towards the middle of the drain would be what Einstein described. But the fact is, is that that curvature is secondary to the molecules of water that are spinning, co-moving, and spinning going into the drain. That's what's producing the effect. And really what my equation shows is that the curvature of space-time that Einstein described is actually the, the result of all these little plonks in the vacuum spinning together, creating the curvature. And that leads to direct engineering towards um, devices that will control the curvature of space-time. Because all of a sudden, 
curving space-time is a matter of spinning the quantum field. If you can spin the quantum field, you can curve space-time according to these equations, and all of a sudden you can produce your own gravitational field, and you can direct them the way you want, and that would give us gravity control, and gravity control will change our civilization profoundly. All of a sudden, you can go to space, you can go to Jupiter for the weekend, you can, you know, um, like, it, it changes everything. We, we would have access to almost infinite amount of resources, um, you know, the, everything becomes very, very different when you have gravity control, and that's just one simple understanding of what gravity is. I have two things to say about this. I, do you know who Bob Lazar is? Yes, I, 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 I have, um, I have met with Bob. I think a few times. Ah, anyway, as you know, of course, he talked about when he was reverse engineering at S four in Area Fifty One, the a craft, uh, and when he talked about the the anti gravity, essentially how these craft propel themselves. Oh, yes. Is oh, yes. I don't think rare. I have met with him, but I, I remember seeing some of the, uh, yeah. But, but, but just as you mentioned, rather than being propelled like we have an airplane, which is, has thrust and pushing it, these g gravity generators are swung in the direction. And essentially, uh, this creates the uh, field for these the craft to essentially fall in, in that direction for infinity in in that direction. Right. And he also talked about the fact, uh, and this is exactly with what you said, that if we can control gravity, then things that we once thought were science fiction will be thrown out the door that afternoon and become science fact. All of a sudden, force fields will become a reality. All of a sudden, uh, mm -hmm. you know, faster than light travel will become a reality. Right. The ability to possibly create a wormhole right. and even alter time. What do you think about that? Absolutely. And and I know that listeners might think that this is going to be generations from now, but, but I assure you that this is coming to our reality very, very quickly. For instance, there's experiments that are being done in Finland where a superconductive uh, material was spun at uh, about 5,000 RPM, and then a, a electron uh, source was fired up uh, and 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 uh, and and it produces a gravitational beam that can have an effect on on an object a kilometer and a half away and this is reported in peer review journal and the beam can the beam uh, velocity or uh, uh, transmission across the space is measured at sixty four times the speed of light so um, so that means that when the electrons are shot across the beam and affects the objects on the other side at 64 times faster than the speed of light. So we're talking about something that's actually happening right now. Uh, gravity control is on its way, and, um, and it will make uh, significant changes. Um, and, and when... Um, and when uh, you actually understand the equations I wrote uh, in combination with understanding the dynamics uh, of the field. Uh, yeah, basically, as um, uh, as Mr. Lazard was talking about, um, when you, when you, you spin the structure of space time, and 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 there's very specific ways on how you can interact with space time to to spin it. Um, of course. Plasmas may be involved and so on, but when you actually uh, create this uh, field, you're creating a toroidal dynamic, and you can displace that toroidal dynamic so that, as you were saying, you're literally falling into the curvature of space-time ahead of the craft, and the craft is just falling through space uh, and moving at very, very high velocity. Um, this is all on its way. Um, and, you know, science fiction has always been ahead of, um, of science fact. Um, you can see that in history all the time. Many, many inventions uh, 
that were that were later um, you know manifested uh, were in science fiction long before um, you know rockets going to the moon, submarines. I mean, many many things we have today and we take for granted planes and so on was in science fiction um, before it was science fact because we need because again we need to visualize it we need to you know we need to think about it and then eventually we can do it exactly and as fast as science and history is written it's rewritten that much faster because uh, the more knowledge we get obviously we have to update the what we know so therefore as you mentioned everything from submarines to airplanes even uh, you know going to the moon that was all science fiction 150 years ago if you told somebody that you can see somebody on a device from across the world in real time and speak to them they would have laughed your brains out but now everybody's out there with an iphone right. the second thing i wanted to say to you uh, going back with re- involving your equations is ben rich the leader of the Skunk Works, uh, of, I don't know if he was vice president or president of Lockheed, uh, in the 90s, early 90s, he gave a presentation at the UCLA Engineering Alumni Group. And at the end of the presentation, he showed a flying saucer and he said three things. Uh, he said, one, that we now have the technology to take E.T. home. Uh, we have things in the Nevada desert that would make George Lucas envious. And he said that the answers to uh, essentially to unlocking things are ESP. But the main thing that relates to what you're saying is he says there was a problem in our equations with gravity. I'm assuming he was referring to Einstein and we had figured them out. And hence, that's where uh, we were able to create gravity. You talked about Finland, and do you do you know about Ben Rich? Do you th- believe that Skunk Works had already uncovered these uh, these equations that you've been working on, and, and you uncovered and have been using them? Uh, I think there was some really good work that has been done. Um, yeah, in black budgets, I mean, they have <laughs> they have definitely the budget to be able to really explore these things and I would be very surprised if they haven't been able to produce some of these effects and get some levels of success with it. Um, absolutely. Um, what's sad is that it stays in these, um, in these um, covert operation and it's not given to the public um, for, you know, the transcendence of some of the most significant problems we have in our society today. Um, and, and, and that's kind of a, the result of the way our society is set up, um, the industrial military complex uh, having very, very large interest and in continuing to sell oil and so on. So it, it really is an issue um, and it, it, it's, it's breaking up now and it's, it's, it's coming out. Um, I can't, it, nobody can tell how far they got. Um, uh, I think there was some issues as well with some of the work they were doing uh, with instabilities, with radioactivity and so on. So I'm not sure they succeeded to the level that they wished they would have. Um, but I think that now we're getting closer and closer to something really, really significant, and our world is going to change dramatically in the next uh, decade. Uh, exactly. Five, over 5,000 patents have been suppressed in the name of national security. Clearly, as you mentioned, the military-industrial complex doesn't want some of these things to be shown. But at, on the other end, 30 years ago, uh, you had only mainstream media. Now we have alternative media. We have shows such as this, which are international. Uh, people have the ability to photograph, videotape something and upload it to YouTube. And it can go viral before anybody has a chance to censor it. And of course, you and your equations and your theories are finally having a chance to have such a major platform where in the past they may have been suppressed. 
And that's why I think it is so important that we continue to push your work because you truly have the answers and we can really get to a better place. Now, I'm going to go back to the Taurus. And one thing that blew me away is, of course, the fact that it has something to do with the double tetrahedron. And, and maybe I'm hoping you could describe that a little bit more with the, if you believe it has 64 points. But what I blew me away was in the Kabbalah, the, the tree of life. Uh, I never understood that. But yet when I saw Thrive and then, of course, with you and, and Foster talking about the Taurus and how it applies to everything, he brought up the fact that the tree of life, uh, along with so many other things, is is obviously using the same uh, principle. And then, of course, so is so many sites in our ancient history, even in the Vatican. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of startling and remarkable. Um, because of the approach I took to um, understanding nature and uh, the studies I've done in physics, and I, I, and I spent some 25 years studying physics full time, um, the, you know, as I was doing that, uh, so I was studying physics, I was studying at the same time nature, and of course, as I studied nature, I studied ancient civilization, because many of the ancient civilization had very deep understanding of the natural world. Uh, I found that so many of them had very significant ancient symbols that um, that seemed to match with each other, like that, that seemed to show various perspective of the same thing, um, uh, across the world. So it, so it seemed like all the ancient civilization, or at least a whole, a big portion of them, agreed that there was a fundamental pattern. That if we understood that pattern, we could literally go to the stars. Uh, and that, um, and that that pattern and now, now this is this is the interesting part is that 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 knowledge was given to man by sun gods or or some advanced civilization that had come to earth from the stars i mean they're very specific about this they they don't talk about the gods as some you know esoteric thing that they are imagining they're talking about the gods as literally having come from the stars and, um, and, and, and having built incredible structures and having made incredible temples and being able to have boats that float in, in the air. I mean, in the Vedic text, they're even more specific. They talk about flying machines, you know, they, um, and, and so on. And when you look at all these symbols, uh, many of them represent a toroidal flow and a fundamental geometric structure that has to do with tetrahedrons. And, you know, so I studied all this because as I was writing the physics and studying the physics, I was coming up with very specific geometric uh, structures that would be at the base of reality, and these seem to match these ancient symbols. And it was kind of remarkable. And it was, it was generally, uh, you know, um, it was, uh, uretic. It, it was, I didn't have the exact equation on how that all worked until more recently when I wrote this equation for the radius and the mass of the proton and, and the, new solution to gravity, where I realized that when I was counting the planks that are inside the volume on the surface of a black hole, they had the little plunk spheres had to be intersecting and because it had to be space filling. Like all the surface of the black hole had to have one plunk there. And so that if they were little plunk spheres, they couldn't be just adjacent to each other because that would make holes between them. It, it, they had to be intersecting, and as I as I looked at how they would intersect, I ended up with these symbols 
like the flower of life symbol that's found in most of the ancient cultures around the world. Um, and, and the way they, they triangulate in, in three-dimensional space with tetrahedral arrays. And so I basically found what I had thought was, was uh, significant, but I found, like, my equation outputted it. Uh, without me even trying, it gives the exact correct solution for gravity when the Planck in, uh, circle interactions or, or toroidal interaction produce that geometry. So, so it's really kind of remarkable, uh, and it really makes you think about what knowledge uh, was present thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, maybe even prior to our written history. Maybe there was a civilization on our planet that was way more advanced than us, that um, that left or evacuated a long time before our written history. I, I'm actually glad you mentioned that. In Peru, there is uh, a, an area, uh, it has a wall, and it's got four four different layers and the top layer is is the modern the layer beneath that is where the spanish conquistadors uh you know when they arrived in peru yeah. the layer below that is the incas but the layer below that is so well done and so precise and the bricks uh, if you want to call them that are so so tight that you couldn't even fit a human hair and yet that predates all of the other civilizations, which clearly shows that anywhere from a thousand to two thousand to several thousand years ago, there was an advanced culture that had technology and the ability to create structures that we can't even replicate today. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, if there was only one or two of those anomalies around the world, it'd be one thing, but. There is literally hundreds, if not thousands, of examples of very advanced engineering, very advanced, you know, um, uh, stone cutting or, or, um, or moving of, of megalithic stones. I mean, even if you find thousand-ton, you know, obelisks that have been moved hundreds of miles from their quarry, I mean, these things don't happen uh, with civilizations that are li literally living, you know, in caves. You know, people, people from that era don't just start building incredibly precise pyramidal structures because they have nothing else to do. Um, it, it, it's, and not only that, is that typically in all of these civilizations around the world, none of them claim to have built these things. They don't go around saying, oh, yeah, we built the pyramids. Like in Egypt, there's no walls anywhere that describes the Egyptian building the pyramids. If anything, there's much more evidence that the Egyptians were saying that the pyramids were already there and they were built by the sun gods and, and that they were interacting with uh, beings that came from the stars. So, um, you know, this might be very hard to believe, but the evidence is very, very strong. And, and then if we think about it from another context, we live in an incredibly rich universe. There's, there's billions of stars in our galaxy alone. Um, as the last survey, we're having a hard time finding stars that don't have planets. It's remarkable. And we're finding more and more, I mean, millions of planets that, you know, from the estimates that are currently available, like even in just our region of one galaxy, they can be millions of planets with life on them. Uh, there is no, and, and why, you know, of course there may be civilization out there that have learned to use gravity, that have learned to travel through space-time using one old, that have been able to, like, go across the universe, or at least across the galaxy, and why wouldn't it be possible that, you know, there was interaction with very advanced beings a uh, very long time ago, and 
and even in modern history, there's a lot of evidence of, you know, UFO activities from, from sources that are very uh, credible. You're talking high-level military personnel, you know, airplane pilots. You're talking, you know, millions of people at this point, a lot of material. And so when you're looking for the evidence uh, with a very uh, sober look, and uh, being honest about the conclusion, uh, it would be hard to conclude that this phenomenon has not been occurring for real and that we may have been in contact with very advanced cultures a long time ago. Exactly. You said so many things that are so true. First of all, every culture around the the planet, every ancient civilization talks about the star people giving them wisdom and so many other things. And like you said, it's undeniable the fact that place people that couldn't have had any contact, for instance, the Egyptians, did they have contact with the Peruvians? No, but you'll see similar structures. And then, of course, as you mentioned with the UFOs, there are so many credible people that have come forward, so many people that have been on the show that you just can't deny. They're unimpeachable in every possible way. Anyhow, we're going to take a quick short break. So much more, everybody, with Nassim Haramein when we return in just a few short minutes. This is Foster Gamble, and you are listening to Dr. J Radio Live. Alright everybody, welcome back to Dr. J Radio Live. Of course, I am your host, Dr. J. And before we resume with Mr. Nassim Haramin, uh, let's just go over some important news. Of course, all the videos are located on Dr. J Radio Live, as this show will be. Uh, Michael Dukakis, who appeared in a couple months ago back in early uh April. The video has been out and you guys have given a lot of comments. Of course, there's mixed reviews because he is, of course, a a Democrat and you Republicans out there have different stories. 
But he is going to come back. And, of course, he would love to take your questions. He's not going to take them on air. So if any of you have any questions you'd like to submit when he's going to be back on, please do. For those of you who have been sharing all your stories and you want me to read them on air, please continue to do so. Everything, again, is available on drjradiolive.com, drjradiolive.com. And, of course, all the recent interviews have been posted. Every one from Michael Cremo to Michael Tellinger, or Tellinger and uh, so many more. And, of course, as, as I mentioned, this will be there. Now let's go to our guest, uh, Mr. Haramine. Uh, welcome back to the hour. I wanted to ask you, where can people find you? Uh, what's your website and uh, what's new for you? What are you going to be doing in the next few months? Oh, thank you. Yeah, there is, um, there is uh, two websites. One is uh, the Resonance Project website, which uh, is a nonprofit foundation, um, which is resonance.is. So resonance is, it's easy to remember. Um, and uh, we have a academy website, uh, the Resonance Academy, which can be found from our website at Resonance Is. So, uh, and so, yeah, we we just actually launched uh, a uh, worldwide academy uh, on the internet where we have courses that people can take. We we just uh, the first of May launched the um, course called the Delegate Program Level 1 course, which is a six module. It's pretty extensive. It's about a 12-week course. It's, uh, it's wonderful. It has all of the information from, from advanced physics to ancient civilization to technologies that are emerging in the world today. And, you know, some very fundamental philosophic roots as well. And, you know, talk about biology and all this. It's all in there. It's remarkable. And it's really great to finally have everything in one place that people can go to. And they can study as deep as they want or, you know, go as light as they want throughout the course. So the Residence Academy is uh, some stuff that I'm very involved with. There's a movie coming out this summer, so that, that's exciting, called The Connected Universe. And it was, uh, it's being uh, worked on uh, and produced by uh, Malcolm Carter, which is a great filmmaker uh, in uh, Canada and Vancouver. And, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to that coming out. Um, and it involves some of my work in there. I think it's going to be a, a really, uh, fun, you know, important movie. Um, so there's lots going on as well. We're working diligently here in laboratory to work, you know, to expand and um, some of the technologies that can be um, uh, tested and and worked on from the theoretical uh, framework of uh, some of the stuff I've written. As well, you know, we're working with other physicists, uh, and so we just published a paper that's going to be uh, presented in a conference in Portugal at the end of this month, um, and that paper describes the um, the brain and the event of consciousness as a result of the interaction uh, uh, with this field of information not being manufactured by the brain but actually being interacted uh, with the brain from this fundamental field of information so that the brain acts more like an antenna than actually manufacturing the the information the um the other thing is i am working with uh, dr uh, amira valbaker on a astrophysical paper and that paper i'm really excited about um we're actually describing cosmogenesis based on the theory i've written so far and the results i've gotten in a completely different way than the big bang 
and were able to describe and prove, um, mathematically at least, that the universe is actually a continuous creation process in which matter um, is continuously being generated from the inside of the universe and matter is continuously escaping our universe. And, um, and interestingly, just recently, last year, a paper that had been lost from Einstein um, that was recovered and published. So Einstein actually published last year. Um, he, um, that paper was Einstein exploring the possibility of a continuous creation uh, universe in which there was uh, matter creation occurring and, uh, and matter escaping our universe. Very, very similar stuff. So I'll be able to quote Einstein. Um, or at least cite Einstein in my paper. Um, so that's all of the stuff I'm involved with right now. And this is exactly why I think you're such an amazing visionary and a true cosmologist, because you are truly in my heart up there with Einstein. And to be able to expand on his theory and to prove what he was exploring as being right and to break away what the mainstream scientists have as old data and bring the new data is really important. Before I go back to asking uh, the ancient, one one other quick question real quick. Didn't you just recently do a TED Talk, TEDx Talk? Yeah, I just uh, actually a few days ago, I was doing a TEDx Talk at um, UCSD, the California University of San Diego. And um, that was a lot of fun. It was a big challenge to try to um, um, to present uh, unified field theory in 18 minutes and have it make sense and have it have some meaning in people's mind. But, uh, you know, I tried. I think it came out half decent. I, I think it'll be all right. I, 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 it's hard to tell because when you're presenting, you know, um, you don't know how it's coming across. But hopefully it worked out. <laughs> that, exactly. And I know it will because you, like I said, you are such a true visionary. And I'm really glad that your information is finally getting out to, to the mainstream because it, what we were talking about at last hour, that fact that a lot of these black budget operations keep everything secret, uh, that's doing a disservice to human kind, to, to all of mankind. Why? Because you don't have the, the most qualified people in in that little tiny box where as opposed to if you give it the information to the public then everybody can step forward and throw in their two cents and uh, make things a little better so the fact that you're able to do this unhindered is fantastic one quick question with regards to what we said earlier the fact that you've had such a lot of your work censored do you believe that is still happening to this day or has finally uh, it's People have backed off in a sense and have allowed you to finally spread this amazing knowledge. Um, <clears throat> no, there's still a lot of censorship. <clears throat> Sorry, going on. Uh, there is a lot of, um, you know, like even just currently, uh, other physicists that are um, that um, advance some of my. Uh, solutions to gravity are trying to publish papers in which they, you know, of course, citing my papers since they're advancing my work um, and they're having, they're having their paper censored. Um, the certain organization are refusing to, to place a paper on the internet and so on. And so it is very much uh, going on still. It's, it's extremely difficult Um in certain, I was in, in certain, uh, when, when I made these predictions of the radius of proton, I was invited to talk at, I'd rather not say names current, right now, but I was invited in very prestigious laboratories in, in Europe to, to give talks, and, and then those talks were censored. So, you know, it, it really is difficult. Um, it is a battle. It is a struggle. Um, but it's, Opening up slowly but surely, behind the scene, there is many, many, many physicists and scientists that are 
coming to us that are very excited about what we're doing, they're not necessarily able to be public about it because of repercussions to their family uh, and to their um, to their career in um, if if they were to become vocal about it. So it it, it is there, there is a push, there is an underground swell that that's occurring, but it's not necessarily obvious right now because of some of the censorship that's that's occurring at the same time. It's really sad that mainstream people who are legitimately looking at your work and realizing that it, it is the holds the answers can't talk about it because of fear of repercussions from not just the ridicule, but uh, even going a step further to possibly silencing them. Uh, Before I go back to the ancient cultures and picking up from that conversation, I want to shift to the movie Thrive, uh, because when we were talking to Foster Gamble, uh, he told me that when he first brought you around, one of his professors from Princeton sort of blew you off because you didn't have a degree. But years later, after he worked with you, he finally came to him in in sort of secret and said that he was sort of right on the money. And I wanted to ask you, uh, how did your relationship with Foster start? And I know he worked with you for about three years, and you did some high-level work with some of the uh, top scientists in the world. And uh, so how, how did that come to be? How did that come to be where you found him, and how did he aid you in getting this information out there? Oh, wow. Uh, Foster was such a significant mentor mentor for me uh, and, and supported me. And, and uh, much of what I'm able to do today had to do with the support that Foster gave me in the early days. And so I'm so grateful to him. Uh, it was really um, amazing, uh, co- uh, if there is such a thing, coincidence, that uh, Foster and I met. I was, at the time, um, I, had, I had just finished about a five-year stretch in which I lived in a van. I lived in a in a small camper van that, um, so that I could do research without having the cost of rent and, and, and the cost of living could be very, very low. Um, and, and so I, was, I had been completely engrossed in, in work, in, in researching every minute of, of awake time I had, and I didn't sleep much. Um, and, I, um, and I was... Um, I was at the end of that stretch uh, where I had completely ran out of resources uh, and I was uh, having to go back. I was in the States and I was having to go back towards Canada uh, because my previous career was a, I was a ski coach and ski instructor um, to go back to try to do a contract so I could make a little more money and go back to researching. And um, I literally didn't have enough money to pay for the gas to go. I was in Joshua Tree in, in Southern California to go back up to Canada. So I stopped in the Bay Area uh, in San Francisco where I knew a few researchers there. And um, I uh, hung out with them and they helped organize a talk. So I could make a little money and uh, and and go on back to Canada, and so uh, this talk was at the uh, at the neglected uh, community um, of uh, you know various scientists and university people, professors, and so on that all hung out in this in this in these locals. Uh, that were called 3220. That was the address, and um, and so I gave the talk there. And so there was a lot of scientists there, uh, a few PhDs in physics, mathematicians, and so on. And one of the person that came was Foster Gamble. And so I gave this talk, and Foster had been studying Buckminster Fuller for a long time. He was well, you know, read on many of the. Um, of the geometry uh, and and as well, you know, studied 
uh, Walter Russell and many other great thinkers um, throughout history. He had developed uh, his own ideas on the fundamental structure of the vacuum and and space and uh, everything he was thinking of and everything I was talking about was meshing so exactly well that um, he became very in control and he was in the middle of organizing a large conference with some very prominent physicists and mathematicians to present ideas, uh, for people to present ideas on unification theory. And so he invited me immediately to go and present there, which was a great honor. Um, and so I presented there, and this started, uh, uh, you know, a relationship that that um, that is still very much present to this day between Foster and I. And, um, you know, he supported me in those early years, uh, got me a small apartment and, you know, made sure I had food on my table so I could continue to research. And so, and eventually my first labs and so on. So it, it really, uh, and Foster is such an amazing person. And what Foster really taught me as well um, uh, was how to, you know, have, empathy and compassion for scientists that have spent their whole life researching something and how it must feel when somebody else comes along and says, well, it's actually not like this. It's more like this. And, you know, how difficult that is for somebody to hear. And so I learned a lot from Foster on the human uh, part of things as well. Uh, you know, on on how to interact with the world in such a way that I wouldn't be um, taking in such an abrasive way. I, I think Foster is such an amazing person because he is a true philanthropist, putting the movie Thrive together with his own money and giving it out for free and then spending millions of dollars to fact-check everything. That, to me, is a true philanthropist. What are your plans for the future with Foster, because I know when we interviewed him, I, I of course, like I said, he spoke very, very highly of you, and all you listeners out there recall that, and of course, you could hear it again on YouTube. Uh, and and what I inferred from him is that he's got more things to do with you. Oh yeah, um, well, you know, his organization and my organization always work in parallel. We're always in contact, and of course, you know, uh, the. Thrive Movement has a lot of value in helping, you know, bring get the word out and getting people involved and uh, in a dynamic way to find solutions and apply them and support the work that's being done. So absolutely, uh, Foster and I always are uh, collaborating and we are as well, um, you know, uh, attempting to help other inventors and uh, thinkers, scientists, and so on, to help them bring either their theoretical work or their technology out and so on into the world, which can be tricky. So, well, you know, uh, I think that um, the academy as well that I just launched and uh, some of the work that Foster is doing with uh, the Thrive Movement is going to mesh uh, in the future and become more uh, coherent. And we definitely have all kinds of collaborative uh, uh, adventures coming up. I, exactly, and I really look forward to them all. One thing I forgot to ask you early on in the show, who was your inspiration? What led you down the path to study physics and eventually come uh, cre get to these equations that really are the answers to everything we've been looking for? I think my inspiration was, um, was definitely... Um, my father early on, um, not directly, because my father was a, a professor of uh, psychology, child psychology, uh, that worked with Piaget in his early uh, PhD piece and then eventually uh, branched off. But, um, but my father was a great thinker. And 
he gave me that sense that um, that things, you know, may not be as they appear. And you have to pay attention. You have to think profoundly about things. You, you, you can't just take it as, at face value. And then, um, and then certainly Einstein was my hero. Um, not just the work he did in physics, but the way he was. The, you know, Einstein was a, was a deep, uh, thinker, a deep spiritual man. I, you know, not in a religious sense, but in a sense of feeling this communion with nature. And, um, and he was, a, he was an amazing, uh, being and certainly, so Einstein, Max Planck, you know, all the greatest, um, um, Newton, Newton was a great inspiration for me, not the Newton that's well known in the typical, um, mainstream view, but actually the private writings of Newton, which are emerging now. Uh, which were censored for 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 hundreds of years, um, where actually you discover that Newton was absolutely not the Newton that's being portrayed uh, in history books. Um, the guy that's very calculated and the guy that's very you know mechanical in in his thoughts and so on. Actually, Newton was very esoteric and came up with incredible knowledge. Um, and many of the things I'm talking about today are present in uh, Newton's private writings, and I really believe that if Newton wouldn't have got censored, uh, we would be going to the stars today. I agree, and I'm glad you mentioned Einstein being your inspiration as well as Newton, because to me, I think not only are you continuing Einstein's work, had he been alive today, not only would he be your colleague, he'd probably be asking you to help him to understand some of the things that you've uncovered. I I honestly put you on that level. Well, I appreciate Uh, it. I, I think that if Einstein was publishing Relativity today, he would be encountering many of the difficulties that we are encountering, you know, people like Foster and I and, and others. Um, it's extremely difficult. And, and if Einstein, even at the time, wouldn't have got the support from, uh, from Planck, from Max Planck, which, you know, basically took Einstein's work and, and brought it to the mainstream and say, we need to pay attention to this. Um, Einstein probably wouldn't have been able to bro- break through. So, so you know, it, it was there at the time, too. And, um, and, um, yeah, and this is the inherent difficulty uh, in the current uh, educational structure and academic structure which does not really open up to um, to groundbreaking ideas so easily. Uh, yes, exactly. And then sadly, it, that's the problem with our society, that things are being withheld and that there is so much trouble to getting this information out there. But this is why I'm so happy that we're in the 21st century and have access to alternative media to be able to get this knowledge out there where it was a lot easier for them, to, the powers that be that wanted this censor, to censor in that era of Einstein, and even, like I said, 20, 30 years ago, whereas now it is much more difficult. They still do it, of course, but it is much more difficult. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, I'm going to go back to what we were talking about prior to the break, about the ancient cultures. You said some things that really fascinate Uh, fascinated me and really resonated with me because just like you, I've been studying uh, the ancient cultures as well. Now, there's, of course, the sacred geometry there, and we we are well aware, and we said this multiple times, that all the ancient cultures had some sort of contact with star people or the, the gods, they call them sun gods, depending on which culture they you talk about had a name for it. That was that provided them wisdom, architecture, uh, and technology, and so many other things. Do you think that 
the humankind at the time, mankind, knew the information that you're talking about now, which is represented in the sacred geometry, the flower of life patterns that appear all around the world, and we lost it somewhere along the line of human history? Or was that what the gods uh, essentially planted here on Earth as a reminder for us in the future to unlock ourselves and understand it for ourselves the way you did, uh, as opposed to teaching it to mankind and losing it uh, uh, throughout time. Yeah, I, I would I would say maybe the latter is um, is what I come to understand from the research I've done in extensive. Um, you know, ancient civilization uh, from around the world, um, and and I, because I believe that um, some of the information was understood by the ancient people, uh, and certainly I think they had a sense of this fundamental field. Um, I don't think that they were able to apply it directly to, for instance, technological development and so on, themselves. I think that the sun gods did that for them and taught them and and worked with them. But I think that as soon as the sun gods actually stopped interacting with the humans of the time, that uh, humanity went backwards in terms of its understanding and it, its capacity to do things. And you see a very, very sharp decline in, you know, construction techniques and capacity to move large objects and all that. All that goes away very rapidly. Um, so I, I, I think the knowledge was mostly held by these more advanced civilization that may have been present at the time uh, early in history. And I know that that might sound really out there, and you know, some people may struggle with that kind of of um, of theories but the evidence is so dramatically uh, present it, it's really hard to ignore exactly it really is one thing that you mentioned earlier is you talked about the obelisks that were uh, so massive in scale and were moved so far from where the quarries were and some people speculate that this the technology used had something to do with sound waves or or something that of course altered the the gravity to essentially make them weightless and to uh levitate and put them in place do you do you know about that? Do you yeah. think that it had something to do with sound, or what's your understanding of how they, the, that technology works? Right. Um, you know, I think that um, there is some veracity to that, um, and but I, I don't think that it was unaided, meaning I, I think that the, some of the technology that I was that I'm discussing, that I'm, you know, attempting to reproduce and some of the technology that was present there has a direct, can be activated or amplified with, with certain sound vocal waves. And so that, so that it, it, the, the sound part that, that's described in these ancient texts where they're talking about moving objects with sound and all this stuff, is actually, you know, amplified by a certain technological uh, means that are present, not just the people using their voice or the sound of trumpets or, you know, it's even described in, in the Bible where, where the, the walls of Jericho crumbles when all the trumpets are blown. But, but what goes along with the trumpet is that this object that was called the Ark of the Covenant that, that had some power source inside it that, that was able to, for instance, is described in the Torah, that was able to levitate on its own and levitate its carriers and, and so on, that that object was utilized to turn around the walls of Jericho for seven days prior to blowing the trumpet and so on. So I think that, you know, it's not just the sound, I think that sound is part of it, but that there's a technology involved that amplifies the effect to create this gravitational effect. 
Another thing that we were talking about, too, of course, is the the fact of the, the different planets, right? And there there's so many out there that the Kepler telescope has found to date 5,000 Goldilocks planets. The ironic thing, though, is they're using the, the, the way they decide the Goldilocks planets are can mankind survive? But see, we're carbon-based. Assume another life form is uh, silicone-based or something else. Therefore, it wouldn't necessarily have to be within the Goldilocks zone. It could be in another uh, environment and another climate to thrive and, and eventually evolve into something else. What do you think that... Obviously, with all these planets being out there, and obviously we just ha there has to be so many different levels of civilization, ranging from people that are far less evolved from us to to beings that are uh, millions of years, if not one billion years, ahead of us in evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, do you? What do you think it's going to take for us to finally get the understanding of the fact that? Yes, life exists out there, and what we need to do essentially to get mankind to understand that just because we can't get there doesn't mean they can't get here. Right. Um, yeah. Exactly. I, I I don't know. I I think that I think that if you're asking when are we going to get it, um, I I think that we're getting close, especially with gravity control coming our way. I think. As soon as we have the capacity to move around a little further than our moon, uh, we might encounter some of these civilizations that have been waiting for us to kind of graduate. I, I believe they're right there on the edge of our awareness. Um, um, I, you know, uh, like you said very correctly, uh, yes, we we are assuming that life develops the same way that we see life on this planet, and that's a large assumption. But even by using that assumption, we're, we're finding a lot of Goldilocks planets out there. And, and that's just for the small sample of planet, of, of star system that we're able to examine. If we extrapolate that percentage, the whole galaxy, you know, it's not 5,000 planets, we're talking millions and millions, if not billions of planets are out there that could support life as we know it. Now they could, and, and we always get surprised that life can emerge out of places we think, even on this planet, where we think no way there could be life there. Like, for instance, not so long ago, we didn't think that life could exist in the deep ocean near these hot vents where the water is almost boiling and, and there is no light and so on. And then we finally got down there, and it's and the, the place is teeming with life. Um, and so, so I actually believe, uh, you know, and I used to say that in physics conference. So I actually believe that the universe out there is teeming with life. And I, and I used to be told that that was probably not the case because water was very in, in the universe should be very rare, and that there's probably not many planets out there. Um, now we know that there is a lot of planets. In fact, most stars have them. And uh, everywhere we look, this is really remarkable, everywhere we look in the universe, even between galaxies, which is very, you know, vacuum-like, uh, uh, we find, you know, spectral lines of water. So, so water is actually present everywhere. Uh, we're even finding that Stars are born in these huge clouds of water, and so on. and so this uh, this idea that um, life is is rare in the universe is finally slowly going away. Now the idea that um, they couldn't make it here is really an arrested idea because um, you know of course. I mean, look at the evolution of computers in the last 50 years. Um, uh, imagine a civilization that has even just 500 years on us, a thousand years on us. 
what would their computer look like, you know, um, or, or, or a few thousand years on us. And, of course, some of these civilizations have understood how to use gravity to their advantage. There is, you know, a lot of evidence in our own physics, in, in our own standard physics, that uh, wormholes exist, that, that you can curve space-time to create links between very far places and, and traverse them. Um, so there is, you know, I think plenty uh, of logical reason to think that uh, advanced civilization most likely have been able to survey our region of the galaxy and has found our planet. And then there's a lot of physical evidence to prove it uh, from ancient history to modern, you know, eyewitnesses that are very credible. That's right. That's right. And, and I, I, I totally agree with what you said. It is the height of human arrogance to believe that we are alone. And as you mentioned, everywhere we look, we're finding planets. Uh, just, just the 5,000 Goldilocks planets we identified are just within our galaxy alone, let alone what's not in our galaxy and places that we can't see. I don't think life is the exception. It's the rule. When me and you were growing up and going to school, elementary school, we were told there was no planets outside of our solar system. Mm -hmm. Everybody who is now 22 years or older uh, or 22 years or younger was in kindergarten uh, when and, and we're taught that life uh, that planets exist outside of our solar system so it's constantly changing in such a dramatic way and another thing you mentioned about the computers it, it, it's very fascinating how fast and how uh, complicated and how complex our computers have become. The lunar module that landed the, uh, the Apollo 11, the astronauts on the moon, had less computing power than a small handheld pocket calculator. And I thought that was extremely fascinating compared to what we have now. Uh, and you're right. I, I can't even imagine what the quantum computers of the future would be or what these high intelligences would be. Um, now, let me go back and, and I'm going to ask you a theoretical question. Assume you were the person in charge of these clandestine organizations or maybe even the president of the United States who was in the know. What would you do to change the world with regards to the understanding you have uh, to es essentially effectuate a, among the mainstream physicists and academics that they're wrong, that, uh, you know, thinking outside the box to explore the equations you have and to essentially disclose to the people all the secrets that have been hidden from everybody. Right. Well, How would you handle it? Wow, that's a big question. I, I, you know, first of all, I would say, uh, the idea that the president of the United States is in the know is a big assumption. Uh, I think that um, I think the industrial military complex doesn't necessarily disclose to the uh, to the um, political branch what what goes on um, down there. Um, but um, the um, the other thing is that. Uh, and, and and again, it's assuming that the president of the United States has the power to do anything about it. And and I don't actually think he does or she does or whoever it would be. Um, but um, but let's say I was in a position to make that transition happen. Uh, I mean, the first thing that has to occur is that the industrial complex, um, you know, the corporations have to be reined in. They have to be taken out of the legislation and the, um, the political uh, process so that they're put in their place and that they become responsible, responsible with the environment, responsible to humanity in what they do on our planet. And that's kind of critical. Um, the, of course, the... Um, releasing some of the uh, information that's available in, in some of these uh, institutions 
would have an impact on the economy, would have an impact on the um, on the industrial complex that would have to be mitigated. So it has to be done in an in an appropriate way so that there is not massive amount of suffering as a result. So, it, but there's a transition that can be done in which the industry is rolled over to a new uh, way of doing things, you know, just like the industry of uh, taking care of horses before the event of the automobile, you know. Um, all of a sudden, these guys had to convert into becoming mechanics. Uh, you know, there is a way to make the transition happen uh, that would uh, that would be very, very uh, positive for humanity. Um, those things uh, would have to come along with some very fundamental disclosures about our history, uh, the community that, uh, that has held information about uh, advanced civilization that might have been in contact with us. I, I, would, I would bring that to the public. I think the public is ready for it. I think the public is way um, more mature in their understanding than what is estimated by the government. Um, and as well, uh, I, would, I would revamp the academic educational system um, in which children are not assumed to be, you know, blank slate that we can just throw information at and just get them to remember it, um, to um, an educational system in which children are encouraged to explore their gift and explore their uh, creativity and to find what um, they are here to contribute to, to humanity and encouraged to think outside the box instead of discouraged to think outside the box. And I think that would probably be one of the most significant changes because there's, there is no reason why we shouldn't have thousands, millions of Einsteins out there. You know, you know, some of these kids that come around these days are incredible. And they need to have a, to be encouraged and supported. And, um, you know, the world we would live in, if that was done, uh, would change very rapidly, dramatically. I like what you said about the president. I also believe you in the sense that I don't think he knows because for for a couple of reasons. First of all, you have a politician who's going to be in there for four maximum eight years. Why would you fill him in, in information mm -hmm. that essentially could be jeopardized versus somebody who uh, would be in it for the long haul? Mm -hmm. And then also, I, I'm starting to believe that I don't know if it's necessarily a government figures that are holding knowledge that it's probably private corporations that don't have to answer to the public okay. freedom of information quests don't, uh, you know, affect them in any way. Okay. Uh, and so I, I definitely agree with you there. And I think that's the way we need to come. There will be changes, as you said, to uh, people's religion uh, and they will be affected. But uh, as humans, we deal with crisis as well, and we can accept change. Although people may fear it initially, I think it's pretty very, very easy to overcome. Right. Now, a couple more questions for you. If What do you think we can do to thrive? I know I'm just taking this out of the movie. We shouldn't be just surviving. We shouldn't have people dying all over the place. Uh, there's no reason to have famine. There's no reason for us to be burning, uh, you know, fossil fuels and destroying our planet mm -hmm. and all this other stuff. What do you think it's going to take for us to change our, our ways? I know I gave you the hypothetical of what would you do if you were, uh, you know, the person in power to disclose, but in, in your own mind, not necessarily being that person in power, what are your general ideas that we need as a humankind globally to that each and every person out there can do themselves to effectuate a better planet? Right. Uh, well, you know, certainly I think that um, being uh, aware of 
you know, what is actually available and going going on is critical People for people to be informed um, that, like, that people can actually have an impact um, by um, gathering and, um, and uh, you know, and, and informing each other and, and supporting each other and being part of organization like Thrive and, 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 you know, making a difference. Like, it actually does a huge, um, it has a huge benefit, like supporting, you know, uh, organizations like Thrive, like the Resonance Project Foundation, allows us to actually move forward and, you know, talking about it with your friends, debating with your family, whatever, you know, but actually being a participant, being you know, involved, getting involved, I think is so critical. But as well, um, at a deeper level, maybe our, you know, uh, even each person actually connecting and that, that, that's something that I find really appealing about some of the stuff I found. I mean, we've had all of these masters come along in our history telling us, go within, that's where the knowledge is. That's, that's where you connect with the divine. That's where you connect with the universe. And the equations I wrote literally said, Exactly that, that the, within the proton is all the information of all the other protons in the universe, that all the information is present. To like actually take the time every day to connect with your, with your source, connect with your nature, to, to spend, a, a, even if it's just a few minutes a day, just going within and connecting and, and walking in the world from that place is, a, I think, can have a massive impact. And of course, in order for our world to thrive, and if we succeed at actually gathering the force and forces and, and as people coming together and making this groundswell that, that, that's going to change the way we do things, of course, technologies are gonna, that are emerging are going to completely change the way we do things. Uh, we can extract an incredible amount of energy from this field of, of information that's present at the quantum level. It's extremely dense. If we extracted one billionth of a billionth of a percent of what's in a centimeter cube of space of that energy, we could run the planet for thousands of years without burning one drop of fuel. Um, and, and, and of course, if we can control gravitational field, we can live, we can be space bound. We can, we can live in space. We can come back to the surface and, and treat the surface as the garden instead of living on the surface. Many civilizations in the universe that, that survive probably eventually transitioned to a space bound culture. Um, because planetary systems change. They go to catastrophic event. They, they get hit by comets or, or even just meteorites or, or just one sun flare in the right direction strong enough and poof, the atmosphere goes and so on. So, you know, there's many different ways um, and many different things that must happen, but I, I think the most important one is that people get involved and talk and, and discuss and, 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 uh, and band together and make uh, that change happen. I actually, I'm really glad you said a couple things, and one of them you actually sort of answered my uh, next question. People do need to get together. People do need to get involved. Uh, sitting quietly and being passive and waiting for the world to change is not going to change. Uh, each and every person has a duty to do it for themselves. Uh, Martin Luther King organized the Million Man March. I'm just blown away why people in the world can't even get 10,000 people together to start protesting, to demanding this sort of knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, the question that I, I was going to ask that you sort of already answered was going to be, uh, when you talked about looking within, I, I was going to ask you, how can people tap into the universal consciousness, which you 
actually already answered. So I'm going to go on to the other question, which is, this is pure speculation, and I'm going to ask you for the both the good and the bad. Where do you see human civilization 50 years from now, 100 years from now, uh, both in the, the proper good sense that applying the equations that you learned, becoming a more peaceful society, and on the other end of the spectrum, where things are continued to be uh, censored and the information is still suppressed and people don't apply what I, what we can learn from you. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the good side of thing, I think that if we make this transition appropriately, um, we will, um, if, if we will, in a very short amount of time, in, in the next two decades, uh, we'll have a civilization that's fairly harmonious with the natural world, that's able to have uh, a very peaceful relationship with each other because many of the issues that produce war and dispute and so on have to do with uh, fear of running out of resources or space and, and so on and overpopulation. I think if we learn to control gravity, which is very possible and, and, and actually is on its way, uh, and, and it's allowed to be brought to the public and it's allowed to be commercialized and so on and that we can uh, transition our society uh, successfully in the next uh, decade or two. Uh, I think this civilization is going to be awesome. I think we're going to do, and it's going to be amazing. Uh, we will be able to uh, be harmonious with each other. We will have almost infinite amount of resources uh, that, you know, because of course, if you can go back and forth, for instance, just to the asteroid belt, you can get chunk, chunks of ice or water, you can get, you know, metals, materials, all, uh, anything you need. Um, and um, and as, as well, the overpopulation problem of our surface goes away. Um, all, all these things become resolved and the stressors that produce war generally goes away. Um, for instance, energy production from the structure of the vacuum becomes the major part of our civilization and changes everything. Now, if, you, uh, if we are not successful at making this transition, if things continue to be censored, if, if, um, if the world doesn't get behind this and actually um, become active and, and, and making this transition happen, uh, it's not looking good. I mean, some of the studies that came out last year showed that, and this was published in Nature, one of the most strict peer-reviewed journal, you know, shows that uh, some of the largest cities in our world will have their coldest day be their hottest day in history by the age, by 2047. Uh, so many of the places uh, on Earth that are livable today will become wasteland. And, uh, you know, our planet, I, I don't think, has uh, much chance to overcoming if, if we don't make this transition. I, I see within 50 to 100 years this planet completely disseminated if we don't make that transition. I, however, am very positive and enthusiastic, uh, and, and, uh, and I have a lot of faith that we will be able to make this transition from what I've been seeing I see everything breaking up into, you know, more and more people, whether inside the military, the agencies, the, the governmental branches and so on, they're awakening. People are, you know, realizing what we're doing and that we might need to change direction. And people have children, they have family and so on. They want this change as well. And so I, I'm pretty uh, positive that it will happen. Well said. I I totally agree with you. We can absolutely live a harmonious, peaceful life and we can achieve uh, so much more. As Michio Kaku says, we are in a type zero civilization. We can be a type one civilization and eventually get to a point where we're interacting with our space brothers and sisters and 
ending this primitive tribal warfare. And and you're right. I, I, I do see great hope for our future. And I hope we don't go down the wrong path of what we've had, because as you mentioned, 2047 could be that pivotal year. And we've already seen this extreme weather happening. Anyway, Mr. Mr. Harriman, it has been such a fascinating interview with you. And you are truly a a true cosmologist of a visionary and so much more. I hope everybody out there has enjoyed this as much as I have. And I want to ask you, if you have one final message you'd like to give everybody out there listening, what would you have to say? Um, I would have to say, wake up every day like it's a miracle, because it is. It is this world, your life, your existence, your capacity to think and be is a miracle. And then, you know, from that place of gratitude and appreciation, go into the world and make the change that we want to see. Well said. Nassim Harriman, everybody, the one and only, like I said, a true cosmologist, a visionary. To me, up there with uh, Einstein, Leonardo da Vinci, and so much more. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Join us again uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, drjradiolive.com. You'll see all the upcoming guests. And with that being said, this is Dr. J signing out.